Good morning and welcome to the morning service of the First Presbyterian Church of Yazoo City. My name is Colton Underwood and I'm filling in for Dr. Charlie Wingard this morning. Don't really have much in the way of announcements outside of the fact that we appreciate your continued diligence in uh, observing the appropriate and adequate social and physical distancing. Would encourage you to continue to do so. But it is at this time that I would ask that we would take a moment to, to reflect, to quiet our hearts, and to prepare ourselves to worship the Lord God. Would you stand with me? O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Let us worship God. You'll sing with me hymn 53, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Almighty 
Pray with me. Our God, you are in the heavens. You are our Father. We come before you this morning. You are the mighty God, self existent in yourself. You are triune, perfect, three in one, Father, Son, and Spirit. You require nothing but your glory. And by your very word, all things were created and all things are kept. We see in your word that through time, you have raised and lowered kingdoms. That you have brought up and brought down rulers, princes, governments. And by your power, the world in just a moment could be destroyed. And Father, we come as your creatures, knowing that that destruction is deserved. We know how we have gone astray. We see our sins. You have made it plain to us. Lord, we know very clearly that we have neglected your precepts. We have hated you, though you have loved us and provided for us everything we need for life and for joy. But instead, we've gone our own way, that way which seems right to us, but leads to death. We have sought the desires of our heart that have not been in accord with your will and have not been in accord with your justice and righteousness. Father, this morning we come to you confessing especially that we have been willfully blind we have turned our eyes away from those who suffer. We have turned our hearts to be cold toward those who are made in your image, precious in your sight. We confess that we have desired comfort and the approval of our peers more than we have desired truth, more than we have desired justice in this world. We confess these to our own guilt, knowing that we have deservedly seen fruit bear from that. And we come before you knowing that we need your cleansing, that we can only find forgiveness for these sins and many more by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so we look to him now. For we have received mercy, though we did not deserve it, because the wrath that was earned by us has been poured out upon him, upon the Son, upon the Lord Jesus as he hung there on the cross. In Jesus, you have spoken peace to rebel hearts. You have welcomed home the prodigal sons and daughters. And by his blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel, it speaks peace. It speaks reconciliation, not judgment. It speaks salvation, not vengeance. Oh, we thank you for him. We rest in him. We go to that fountain now, which alone can cleanse us. 
We ask that you would draw near to us in this hour as we seek to worship you, that you would assure us of our pardon, that you would, from the spirit that is within us, convince us and and show us day in and day out that we are yours, that we are your sons and daughters, that though we fall, we will not be cast headlong. For you, O Lord, hold our hand. Comfort us this morning as we come to hear your word. Bring life to those who are languishing and downtrod. Give us a zeal, a zeal to love you and to show that love to the world. Make us holy, O Lord, and cleanse us each day. All of this we ask by the words that your Son taught us to pray, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters of God, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament reading for this morning comes to us from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 28, verses 14 through 22. Isaiah 28, 14 through 22. Just before we read to remind you, as it was a, a few weeks ago that we read from Isaiah 25, the general context of Isaiah's ministry, of his prophesying, was during the time of the divided kingdom of Israel. Roughly 700 years or so before Jesus Christ was born. And it was at this time that Isaiah was prophesying primarily to the southern kingdom of Israel as judgment was soon to come to them. You see, Israel had gone astray. They had worshipped idols for hundreds of years, had disobeyed and had broken the covenant with their Lord who had been merciful to them, brought them out of Egypt and given them a land for their own possession And so, for their unfaithfulness, judgment was to come. They would be sent into exile. And this particular passage, verses 14 through 22, is a judgment against those who were rulers in Jerusalem, the rulers of the people who had led the people of Israel even further astray. You see, of particular concern in this passage is the fact that they had sought Egypt for a covenant. They had made an alliance, a political arrangement with the nation of Egypt to be saved. They were going back to those who had enslaved them, had subjugated them just a few hundred years earlier, and were seeking their help. They were looking to Egypt and to the strength of their armies, to the help that they would get from them. And they were not trusting in the Lord God. And so the Lord tells them very clearly through the prophet Isaiah that this covenant is not a covenant that brings life. It is a covenant of death to them. That which they thought would bring them salvation and help will be judgment upon them. God promises to lay bare, and he does lay bare, the refuge of lies that they have built up for themselves. They have sought help outside of the Lord, and he will prove this to be insufficient. Yet in the midst of this judgment, which can be saddening if we look at it uh, just from that angle, there is yet a promise. 
You see, in verse 16, there is a promise for those who would look to the cornerstone, the precious cornerstone to be laid in Zion. It is this cornerstone that is God himself. And those who go to the stone, the cornerstone, and believe upon it will not be in haste, will not be put to shame. It means that they will trust in God rather than in man and will so be saved from the wrath that is deserved. And of course, we know, as we'll talk about later in the New Testament, this cornerstone is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our rock of refuge. Hear now God's word. Therefore, hear the word of the Lord, you scoffers, who rule this people in Jerusalem. Because you have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with Sheol we have an agreement. When the overwhelming whip passes through, it will not come to us. For we have made lies our refuge, and in falsehood we have taken shelter. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am the one who has laid as a foundation in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not be in haste. And I will make justice the line and righteousness the plumb line. And hail will sweep away the refuge of lies and waters will overwhelm the shelter. Then your covenant with death will be annulled and your agreement with Sheol will not stand. When the overwhelming scourge passes through, you will be beaten down by it. As often as it passes through, it will take you. For morning by morning it will pass through, by day and by night, and it will be sheer terror to understand the message. For the bed is too short to stretch oneself on, and the covering too narrow to wrap oneself in. For the Lord will rise up, as on Mount Perizim, as in the valley of Gibeon he will be, he will be roused. To do his deed, strange is his deed. To do his work, alien is his work. Now therefore, do not scoff, lest your bonds be made strong, for I have heard a decree of destruction from the Lord God of hosts against the whole land. God bless the reading of his word. Let us go before God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come to you and confess that we have not worshipped you as we ought. You are the only God. You are the only one in this universe worthy of praise, worthy of honor, worthy of our adoration. And yet we've given our adoration, our trust, our hope to vain things. We have built up a refuge of lies, a house of straw that cannot last. Father, though you have been kind to us, even still we have railed against your kindness. We have not seen you as a father, though you give to us all that we need. We have not loved you and obeyed you as we ought. And so we look to you for pardon, because it can only come from you. We thank you that you have put forth Jesus, your son, the eternal. He is our mediator. Though he, by his word, made food for mankind and water, he was subjected to hunger and to thirst. He, who is perfect in all ways, was tempted in everything, just as we are, yet without sin. He, who is from the beginning of the world and before, was subjected to a body that bore death and a punishment undeserved to him. For upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, you were pleased to put him forth as a substitute for us, to bear our sin, to bear the wrath that we deserved. We look to him now and pray that after him, you would shape us into his image and make us a people of humble devotion. We pray that we would adhere to the everyday, ordinary means of grace in a way that is honoring to you that we would cling to your word, that devotionally, daily, however often we can, we would go to your word, the Bible, that we would read it and not just give it a, a cursory read through and, and just tick that box, but would meditate upon it, 
would let it sink in, would chew upon every word and savor it. Pray that we would hear it preached consistently and that you would apply the words to our hearts and that when the time comes and when it is prudent to do so, that you would allow us to see that word tangibly in the sacraments, in baptism, and in the Lord's Supper. We look forward to that time. And we pray that you would make us a people of humble prayer, that we would be overjoyed by the ability to come before you, to lay our hearts bare, to let our petitions to be known before you, our Father. We pray that we would be bold in this and do so out of faith. We do so this morning, praying that you would lift up those who are chronically ill, who suffer in ways that do not fade and sometimes seem to worsen. We think of Jerry Davis at this time. We ask that you would strengthen him and provide for him and that in the midst of suffering, you would cause him to behold your face, that he would know that he is being refined. We ask also for Pease Graber, and that you would be with his family as they come around him in this time. It's been a hard week. Father, be near to him now. Give him the energy and the drive to, to continue forth day by day to live for you. We ask that you would be with those who are continuing to seek to bring your word to the ends of the earth. I think especially this morning of John and Catherine Bogard in Indonesia, as they seek to, by the means you've blessed them with, bless the most isolated people in this world, that they would be energized each day spiritually to go forward, to see the gospel preached even when fruit is hard to come by. Pray that you would provide for their needs, that you would give them their daily bread, keep them healthy, protect them from disease and from physical harm, and support them emotionally. It's hard to, to be so far from so much of what has, for much of life, been familiar. Support them, Lord, and cause them to take shelter in you, that they would rest in Jesus Christ alone day by day. We pray this morning also for our presbytery, the Presbytery of the Mississippi Valley. We thank you for the leadership of our presbytery, for the leaders that are guiding us, who are so dedicated to the word, to see it preached in whole. I ask that you would continue to unite us, the churches that belong to this presbytery, that we would work together and that the work of the presbytery in all areas would be blessed, that you would establish the work of their hands. We think also of those who have just been married or, or are very near to being married. We thank you uh, for the union of, of Andrew and Emily Bird that just took place yesterday. We uh, praise you for it and also lift up Alex Dixon and Amy Walker as they look forward to very soon being wed. We ask that you would make these unions, these marriages, centered only and ever around you. That they would both parties have eyes fixed upon you and have a, an understanding of your grace such that they would live that out in their dealings with one another. Point them through this temporary marriage to the eternal marriage, to the marriage that we as the church will one day experience with the Lord Jesus Christ as he brings us in his bride. Use it to sanctify them, turn their eyes to you. Father, we praise you and thank you for the overabundance of good things with which you've blessed us. While we cannot pass the plate at this time, we, we ask that you would continue to provide for the ministries in which this church is engaged and uh, encourage each of us to give as you have blessed us, that we would be thankful through this simple act of giving, uh, to be thankful for everything that you give us, every small thing. We know it is from your very hand. Father, we pray this all, relying upon him who is our cornerstone. We look to Jesus now. We pray it in his precious and holy name. Amen.
Let us continue to sing praise to our God by singing Psalm 147. And Dorothy's going to play through it uh, one time for us. seated. It is now at this time that I would invite you to turn in your copies of the scriptures or just look at the bulletin where the the passage is printed out to to go to our scripture passage uh, for preaching this morning. It comes to us from 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 4 through 12. 1 Peter 2 verses 4 through 12. Now it's been a, a, a couple months at this point since we were last in in First Peter. So just by a brief way of reintroduction to the letter, it is a letter, and it is from Peter, as one would expect. It is uh, from the same apostle who we see in the Gospels, Simon Peter, and through Acts as well. And it was written to uh, several churches, churches listed in verse 1 that are scattered throughout Asia Minor. It's the region in modern day we would know as Western Turkey. And the reason that Peter wrote this letter to them is because they were beginning to experience a systemic sort of persecution that was relatively unknown to the church at the time. There were scattered martyrdoms and persecutions, but not until the latter part of the first century AD and then on for the next couple hundred years would the church really begin to feel the grip of persecution. And these churches were some of the first. And so Peter is writing to them now to encourage them that in the midst of their persecution, in the midst of their hardship, they would cling to God, that they would strive forward in the walk of faith. And by the time we have reached where we are in in the epistle, in chapter 2 and verse 4 and following, Peter has by this point grounded firmly the hope of these suffering Christians in God alone that God is their hope and salvation, that he has their inheritance untouchable. It is invincible. It is pure. It is undefiled. And he roots them also in God's word and his promises as he fulfills them in his word. And so, going forward into instructing these Christians and how to live, how to behave, he shows them how it is needful for us Christians to leave behind sin to pursue God with all that we are, desiring after maturity of faith, only found by clinging to the Word of God, which is the pure spiritual milk. And so Peter continues to instruct us in how to live the Christian life. And he will continue in verse 4 in doing so. But as we prepare to read from God's Word, I'd ask that first we would go before God in prayer. Father in heaven, would you open this word before us? Give us spiritual eyes to see your beauty, spiritual ears to hear of your glory, and that you would work in us, change our hearts, 
Hide me behind your cross, O Lord. Protect me from error and cause only what is good and right to be remembered. Pray that you would bless this time and the reading of your word now. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hear now God's word. As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word, as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's possession, for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Who am I? Or rather, who are you? It's a relatively simple question. Shouldn't need a lengthy answer, one would think. But it's one that plagues our world, it plagues our culture, it plagues so much of what's going around us. We're obsessed with our identity, we're obsessed with who we are. I hope the, the bug is deceased. <laughs> You're fine. You see, uh, in the last decade, if you didn't know, identity was one of the words of the decade. It's something that everyone is fixed upon. Why would that be? It's because our belonging in this world, our sense of meaning, our sense of, of purpose, it's all wrapped up in that question, in that question of who we are, of what we are here for. So who are you? As Christians, we have answers. We, we know God has revealed it to us very clearly who we are. As humankind in general, we know that we are image bearers. That God from the beginning has made us male and female, no matter what color, what race, anything, in the image of God. And that because of this image, we are valuable in his sight. That it gives value to every individual human life. We are image bearers. But even still, that image is not perfect. Because by our sin in Adam and by our own willfulness to sin, we have stained ourselves by that sin in such a way that we cannot remove. And so we require cleansing. Humankind is sinful. We know this very well. And we have a need for cleansing, a need for repentance. And so for Christians, we look here and see, as Peter continues to instruct these suffering, persecuted Christians as how to live that Christian life, he reminds them of their identity, of who they are, of who they are in God's sight. You see, in the heat of battle and in the midst of persecutions and tribulations and trials, it's so easy to forget who you are, why you're here. And I want to take a moment this morning to take a step back that we may all be firmly rooted in knowing for sure, if we are in Christ, who we are. Peter identifies all believers in three primary ways through this text, and it should shape how we live, how we think, how we do everything. Firstly, Peter identifies all Christians. Christians are living stones. 
Christians are living stones. Secondly, Christians are a people for God's possession. A people for God's possession. And thirdly, Christians are strangers in a foreign land. Strangers in a foreign land. That is who we are. That is who you are. You are living stones. Peter writes in verses 4 and 5, As you come to him, that is Christ, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You see, just as Peter uh, prefaces who you are by who Jesus is, we need, we need to understand that our identity as living stones, as human beings, is only made sensible through him, through Jesus Christ, the living stone. You see, Peter quotes here in verses uh, 7 and 8, or 6, 7, and 8, uh, three passages from the Psalms and from Isaiah, and he's pointing to the fact that Jesus is the promised stone, the living stone, the cornerstone that is promised throughout the Old Testament as God's chosen refuge, that all that believe upon him would be saved from judgment, though they deserve it. We are those living stones after him the living stone you see the image uh, that peter uses is that of building a house and a cornerstone in the building is the first stone traditionally that is set and all other stones that are built around it and are built upon it bear their meaning bear their purpose in the structure and and are given a foundation from that cornerstone and so your foundation, my foundation, the foundation of the church, the body of Christ, is in him. Our foundation is the Lord Jesus. He holds the structure of the church together. And that means that you and I, as stones within that spiritual house, only have a purpose in it as related to him, the cornerstone, Christ the Lord and this means three primary things for us in our Christian lives. First and foremost, though you may be a father, a mother, a student, an athlete, a lawyer, a doctor, whatever you may be, your first identifier, your primary identity is not in any of those things. Your identity is not even primarily in the word Presbyterian. Your identity must be in Christ. Living stones after the living stone. We are followers of the Lord Jesus. That is who you are. That's what gives you your purpose as those who have been called to be conformed to his image. Our purpose is based off of him, Christ. Secondly, the fact that we are living stones being built up into a spiritual house points to the reality that there is more than just one. I am not the only stone. We as First Presbyterian Church of Yazoo City are not the only stone collectively. And so we must never lose sight of that. There is a greater work at play than just within our walls. God is building up a structure of, of Baptist stones of Methodist stones, of non-denominational non stones, of Anglican stones. He's building up a spiritual house together of believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is a unity that transcends that which divides us. And while it is important to understand our little details of doctrine, we must never divide ourselves unnecessarily. We must, we must seek to have peace within our walls and with those that are living stones outside our walls as well. You are living stones being built into a spiritual house. And then thirdly, along this same line, our purpose as being built into a spiritual house, which is the dwelling place of God, is to, as Peter tells us, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And what is this spiritual worship? 
This spiritual worship is to offer up our minds, our bodies, our everything to the Lord. That our all is to be His. To love Him with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. To serve Him as He ought to be served. That is our purpose. You are living stones if you are in Christ. You are shaped after Him, the Lord. You are to live in peace with other living stones. And you are to offer yourselves all that you are to Him as acceptable spiritual worship before Him. That is who you are. Secondly, if you are in Christ, you are a people for God's possession. Peter writes in verses 9 and 10, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Peter, in this passage, in, in pointing us to who we are, also points backward to who we once were. That before Christ came in, before we were redeemed, before the blood was applied to us, we were not God's people. We had not received mercy. And that should be a terrifying thing. You see, in Hosea 1, that's what this is a reference to. Hosea, the prophet, was commanded to marry a wife who was a prostitute and to have children with her. And the children that he would have were to be named No Mercy and Not My People. This was judgment upon Israel. Though God had been gracious to them and had loved them as a son, they had willfully turned away and so had warranted wrath for themselves. And this was a pronouncement of judgment upon them. Yet even there in that very passage, God points forward to a future reconciliation, to a future salvation, saying, and in the place where it was said to them, you are not my children, it shall be said to them, children of the living God. Say to your brothers, you are my people. And to your sisters, you have received mercy. Peter is showing you and I this morning that that passage in Hosea is fulfilled in us. That we, who have separated ourselves from God and have warranted his judgment by our sin, Jew and Gentile alike, have been made God's people. That though we do not deserve it, he has given us his mercy purely by his grace, purely because of his love. This is why he calls Christians in this same passage a chosen race, a people for God's own possession. God chose you. We know that we were once children of wrath. We had not received mercy. It is God's imperative or impetus alone that has kindled in us any love for him. That should inspire you to go forward. That should give us a, a great love for him who has saved us. Because he has done so out of his good grace and love alone. Not because you were wise. Not because you were knowledgeable. But because he had love. And it should show us that we are set apart to be holy. As he points this out in the phrase that we are a holy priesthood. We are a kingdom of priests to God. As Christians, this should be possibly the most beautiful reality of all of these things under the heading of being God's people. See, in the Old Testament, the, the priests were a, a particular section of the people. It was only a, a particular family that would be able to serve in the temple and, and approach God. And even then, only the high priest, one man, would be able, after many physical uh, cleansings and ablutions, would be able to go before the Lord God in the holiest of holies. But now, in the New Testament, we are all priests. 
We are a kingdom of priests because Jesus Christ, the great high priest, has entered once for all into the heavenly holy of holies, has torn that curtain in two that separated it from the world, and has welcomed us in. That because of his blood alone we may come to God, we may approach him. We are priests, children of wrath, a holy priesthood. Your God is merciful and gracious. He chose you in Christ if you are his, so behold your God. And as Peter calls us to do, proclaim the excellencies of him who brought you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Your purpose as God's chosen people is to be a light to spread the light of the gospel and the heat of the warmth and love of Jesus Christ. If we have been so changed, how could we withhold that from our neighbors? How could we look upon one who is suffering and turn our backs? If we have been so changed by the love of God, what excuse do we have to not bring that message to others? That is our purpose. As a people for God's possession, you have been changed so that you might proclaim his excellencies to those who are in darkness because you are there too. He brought you out because of his love. So show that love to others by showing them Jesus. You are a people for God's possession. That is who you are. And finally, Christians, those who are in Christ, you are strangers in a foreign land. Verses 11 and 12 read, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Peter refers to the redeemed Christians as sojourners, as exiles, as pilgrims in the world, as those who do not have a home, who are wandering, as those who are scattered abroad. We know that there is no particular region in the world that we can look to and say, that is the redeemed and the rest are not. No, we are scattered even within our own midst. We are a scattered people, those who are truly his. And we are also a people in a hostile land. People who are surrounded by those who may on the surface appear to be favorable toward Christians, but when you present the true gospel to them, the world does not love it. The world hates the gospel. But this is not offered to sadden you or to to bring you down. Rather, it is given to make us glad and to motivate us to live in a way that is honorable. You see, being exiles should motivate us to realize that our home is not here. Our home is in heaven. Peter speaks in a a similar way as Thomas Kempis, the, the German medieval mystic, said, if you wish to stand and progress as you ought, that is in the Christian life, hold yourself an exile and a pilgrim on the earth. To live the Christian life, to bear the cross, to do so knowing that this world is not your forever home. This is a temporary home. And you are striving toward heaven. Aware of this, Peter tells you to live accordingly in two ways primarily. That firstly, being exiles whose home is in heaven, we are to flee from the passions of the flesh which wage war against the soul. If I were given an outrageously large gift card to to a wonderful steak restaurant in Jackson, and say they have an evening, Rachel and I, we just recently celebrated an anniversary, so maybe uh, we decided that we're going to go have a wonderful dinner together. We're going to enjoy steak and and, and a beautiful bottle of wine and and several courses. It's going to be one time, you know, we don't do this frequently, uh, 
but we're just going to enjoy ourselves. So say Rachel's driving from work, it's a Friday night, and I'm driving from Yazoo City, and I get, I'm all dressed up, like I am now, and I get into the car, and I start driving on 49, and then all of a sudden, what am, I, what am I struck by as soon as I get outside of my little street there? See the golden arches. How foolish would it be for me to say, well, you know, it is about 50 minutes, and I'm feeling a bit peckish, so I'll swing by. You know, I'll have a few burgers, no big deal. Soon enough, I, I, I have no m more interest in going and meeting my lovely wife for a wonderful dinner because I've filled myself with something lesser. You would see that and, and say, what are you doing? It's just 50 minutes, just keep driving. You're going to be fine. What, what's at the end of that road is, is way, way more worth it than what you're stopping for. You've had that a thousand times. It may sound silly, but how much worse is it if we who call ourselves Christians fill ourselves on the desires of the world? It's like eating mud. It's insubstantial. It's not giving you anything. In fact, it's worse. It's like chewing on rocks. You're hurting yourself. It's drinking poison. So often we do not realize it, but those who fill themselves on the delights of this world do so to their own condemnation. Flee from it. You will fall. You will certainly, at points, want to swerve off the side of the road. But I encourage you, there is something so much greater at the end. Press on. And if you've gone off the freeway, get back on. Rest in the Lord Jesus. He is enough. Flee from the desires of the flesh. And secondly, being foreigners in the midst of a hostile land, we are called to keep our conduct pure among the Gentiles, among the unbelievers. Now, forgive the analogy, but the best way that I can illustrate this is when Rachel and I moved to the South. Now, I'm not saying that the South is a hostile land or that it's full of Gentile unbelievers. Quite the opposite. Rather, a couple months before Rachel and I moved down here, we were, or I was confronted with a couple regulars at, a, at the bar that I worked at before we moved, and they were Southern transplants. They were from Alabama. And when they heard they were, we were moving to Mississippi, they wanted to give us a lay of the land, give us a, a few pointers, little tips about how to maybe blend in a little better, how to acclimate to the culture a little better, because as a server especially, they told me that if I'm going to go up to a table and say, well, hey guys, hey you guys, that I'm going to be ostracized from the very moment that I say that, that someone's just going to kind of wink at me and say, well, bless your heart, and, and, and then I'm going to just be the Yankee from then on out. And so... In their exhortations, I was compelled to be a good northerner. Now, I don't know how well of a job I've done, but I was determined to be the best northerner that these southerners would ever meet. That because of how great I am, I'm not great, that, that southerners would see that and, you know, think that the Midwest isn't that bad. You know those Hoosier boys? They're all right. How much more is that important for us to avail ourselves to a dying world by how we live, by our conduct? It's easy to let slip the small things. Um, I find myself when I'm maybe uh, in, in a call with someone who's from customer services and I'm frustrated. I, I can speak certainly very easily as an unbeliever. And it's much to my shame because then I'm immediately convicted about it if I'm impatient toward them, unkind toward them. Or perhaps if I go somewhere and my facial expressions are not exactly the most welcoming in the world. I have problems with that sometimes. Through even the small things, but also the big things, we're called to show the love that Christ has had upon us to the world. In everything that we do, in our 
facial expressions and the tone of our voice and everything that we say, we should be showing the world love because of him who loved us. And then when they go to speak against us, all they're going to speak against us is how much we loved, how much we talked about Jesus, how much we were dedicated to the Bible. Let those be what we're known by in the midst of an unbelieving world. You are exiles. You are pilgrims in the midst of this world if you are in Christ. So flee from the desires of the flesh and keep your conduct pure among an unbelieving world. You see, the question of identity for unbelievers is constantly in flux. It's very fluid matter. But for Christians who are found in Christ, we may know for certain who we are, definitely, assuredly. Your identity, first and foremost, is in Christ, following after him as living stones follow the cornerstone. Therefore, offer up your bodies as spiritual sacrifices to him and live in peace with the other living stones. You are a chosen people, a kingdom of priests. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. By the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ alone, you have been brought near and reconciled to God that you may call him Father. Therefore, show the world and tell the world the glories and excellencies of him who saved you. And you are exiles. This world is not your home. Heaven is your home. Therefore, set your mind on the things of the Spirit. Lay up your treasure in heaven, forsaking sin, and let every aspect of your life in the midst of this dying world be a living testament to his love and mercy. Now, as we close, I want to divert from everything I've been building to and, and, and speak kind of to the side uh, in reference especially to verses 7 and 8 but also to Isaiah 28. There's that tension of judgment and salvation in the midst of these passages that there are those who stumble and they stumble upon the rock that is salvation to others toward their judgment. You see, just like Israel built up a house of straw in trusting in Egypt, we ourselves build up a house of straw when we trust in our own righteousness, when we trust in ourselves, when we trust in our obedience, when we trust in the strength of mankind, even if it's the strength that's within us. And so if you leave understanding anything, if you've not heard anything until now, hear this. This is not a decision that you can just walk away from and think, I've checked the boxes, I'm good. I've lived a good life. I've done the right things. I've broken the Ten Commandments a couple times, but you know, God forgives. You can only trust in Christ. If you are trusting in yourself, for rescue on the day of judgment, you will be left with nothing. Only Christ, only Christ, only take refuge under him. Find help in the shelter of his wings and he is your sure salvation. He alone, not your own righteousness, is your sure salvation. Go to him, he is the cornerstone, he is the rock of refuge for all who would believe in him. Take shelter under him. Find him. He is faithful. He will come to you. By God's grace, I ask that you would turn, that we all would turn, clinging to him, to the one who bore your sins, trusting in him alone as the unshakable stronghold of salvation. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we confess that we have not been thankful. We have not been faithful. That we have sought our identity in other things. That we have sought to be known more than by your son, but by temporary things, things that do not last, things that 
bring about our shame. We confess this and look to him now, him who is the cornerstone, the one who has taken the blow for us, our shield, our help. We look to Jesus Christ alone and to his righteousness as he gives it to us freely as a gift, not by works, not by works. I pray that you would make us aware of the implications of our identity, of our in Christness, that we would live as exiles, as living stones, as a chosen race in a way that is pleasing to you. Change us now and prepare us for all that you have before us. We ask it all in his precious name, in Jesus' name, amen. And looking alone to Jesus, let us respond to the gospel by singing hymn 342, Christ is made the sure foundation. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Hi. 